in chapter one of Kingdom of God. Um, so one of our in-person students wanted me to repeat um, about the the dominion that God has given to us. Okay, so we uh, we read that in um, Genesis chapter one verses twenty seven and twenty eight that He blessed them and said, "Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion." Okay. We also read in Psalm 115, verse 16, that the heavens are the Lord's, but the earth he has given to the children of men. Psalm 115, verse 16. So the deputization of the earth to man, or when God gave the dominion, dominion of the earth to man, it was so complete that God himself did not intervene and prevent Satan from tempting man. Okay, So when God gave the dominion of the earth to man, it was so complete that God himself did not intervene Okay, to prevent Satan from tempting man. And so we see that when Adam and Eve sinned, they gave their authority over to Satan. And how do we know this? Luke chapter 4, verses 5 and 8, he says, or Jesus, uh, Satan tells Jesus, all authority has been given to me and their glory, okay, uh, for it has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish, okay. Um, so the authority that Satan boasted of that was given to him was not given to him by the Lord, but was originally belonged to man and given to you know, you can put on this fan, he's feeling very hot, you know, was given to um, uh, Satan by man, okay? Uh, now, another in-person student wanted me to talk about the two things, right? Mm, that's what he wanted, right, uh, Diksha? Mm. Okay, so um, the two things I want to bring to your attention uh, about the fall. Okay. No, they want that fan on. It's not working, then you can put this one. Can somebody help him, please, if he doesn't know quickly because it's uh, taking our time? Thank you. Okay, you, you need to put off this light because it's too bright. The, uh, the... Can you please put off this tube light? Yeah, thank you. Okay. So, um, two things. Why did uh, Lucy's question is, why did Satan come to earth, sister? Why did Satan come to earth? He was thrown from heaven, so he was on earth. Okay, Lucy. Now, Diksha's question is, what are the two things uh, that we, you know, like I said, I want to bring your attention to two things that um, from Genesis chapter 1, okay? from Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28, the two things. The first thing is that when Adam and Eve sinned and the fall took place, the lordship of the earth that God had given to man was then handed over to the devil. Okay, So now devil, uh, then devil or Satan took or gained control temporarily over the earth. So that's the first thing. Okay, So... Satan gained control temporarily over the earth. The second one is um, man's concept or understanding of king and being a heir of God. That was basically damaged or that was harmed or stained. You know, instead what happened, man went into being slaves or being subjection to the enemy okay so we developed a mindset of being slaves a mindset of slavery a mindset of subjection okay subjection means coming under the rule of somebody else or being slaves okay and that was not what god had intended now this is very important because if we if we are when we are born again, we become part of God's kingdom. But if you are coming with that same mindset of being slaves or being subjects, subjects and not being heirs of God, God's kingdom, what would happen? What would happen? 
Are you able to understand what I'm saying? We were formerly slaves, subjects under, under Satan. Now we are born again, but if you don't lose that mindset of being slaves or being under subjection, what happens? We are still slaves. That means what happens when we are part of the kingdom of God? Yes. Uh, we, we won't reach the full potential for which God created us and for the purpose for which he created us. Yes, yeah, see, we won't reach that full potential or the intent of why, why he created this kingdom. He made us hairs. What else? You don't know who you are in Christ, okay? You don't take your responsibility. You don't know your authority. You'll just be seated and, you know, you will just be complacent. You won't be doing anything when you, God is looking up to you to extend and build his kingdom, okay? So uh, when God redeemed mankind, okay, he wanted to restore these two things. He wanted to restore, what are the two things he wanted to restore? What are the two things he wanted to restore? Hello, what are the two things he wanted to restore? I just now told you the two things, right? The two things that are brought to your attention from Genesis chapter 1, verse 27 and 8. What are the two things? First thing? His authority. His authority, okay. The authority that he has given to whom? Man. Over what? Over the earth. To rule and to have dominion over the earth. Okay, so he wanted to get back that authority and he took back that authority and he's given that authority to whom? To church, right? Okay, and also the second thing, what does he want to do? He wants us to change our mindset, our understanding is yes. from being what? From being what to what? From being slaves to being subjects to being heirs of? God, to recognizing that we are hairs of God and joint hairs with Jesus Christ, okay? Um, now, it's a little difficult for some of us to transition from that mindset, yes or no? Yes, we still find it very difficult to uh, transition from that mindset of being a subject uh, uh, under Satan or being slaves of sin or, you know, uh, to being uh, joint hairs with Jesus Christ or being hairs of God, okay. So, but this is where God wants us to be, okay. God will help us to overcome that uh, mindset to transition to where He wants us to be. But we need to come to that place. We meet, need to make that conscious effort where God wants us to be. So we can operate from that realm. We can operate from that position that we are heirs of the kingdom that He has prepared for us. And therefore, we are children of God and we have the authority, okay? Now, we see that after the fall, you know, we see the kingdom being reintroduced by Jesus, okay? So when Jesus came on the earth, he reintroduced the kingdom. And we know that John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of Jesus, he wanted to prepare the coming of the Savior. So what was his message for us. Look at what Matthew chapter 3 verse 2 says. Can somebody read that please? What does Matthew chapter 3 verse 2 says? Matthew chapter Matthew chapter 3 verse 2 and saying repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, right? Okay, so, so his message, John the Baptist's message is what? Repentance for the kingdom of God is here. Repent for the kingdom of God is here. So he's saying that the kingdom of heaven has come. You know, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is uh, invading our fallen world. Okay, and uh, God is reintroducing his kingdom here because that was his heart. That was his original intent to have a kingdom prepared for a people who would be heirs of God and co-heirs with Jesus Christ and would inherit this kingdom. So when Jesus comes right after John the Baptist, what was his message? Look at Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. What does Matthew chapter 4? 
For that time, Jesus began. From that time. From the time Jesus began to preach and to say, "Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is hand." Yes, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at um, hand. Okay. So when Jesus began to preach, he says, "Repent." The same message: the kingdom of heaven is here. Is at hand means what? It's yeah, it's here. It's near. It's very close to you. It's coming into your world. So, what is coming into your world? What is near? The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Okay. So, when we read the Gospels, you know, we see Jesus speaking so much about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. Okay. Yes, he mentions a little bit about the church, but we see that mostly Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven in all of his parables okay so every time he starts a parable he says okay i'll tell you another secret concerning the kingdom of god or the kingdom of heaven and then he gives us a parable he gives us a story and then he starts by saying okay the kingdom of god is like or the kingdom of heaven is like and then he goes on to speak the parable and give the meaning or the interpretation so when he's doing that he's basically unveiling to us or revealing to us the different aspects about the kingdom of god so we see that when jesus was preaching and teaching most of the time he was preaching and teaching about what the kingdom of god or the kingdom of heaven okay now in matthew chapter 4 verse 23 um, you know it uh, tells us about the ministry of jesus so can somebody read matthew chapter 4 verse 23 please loudly matthew chapter 4 verse 23 and jesus went about all galilee teaching in the synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people amen so jesus went preaching the gospel about the kingdom he was preaching the good news the gospel means what the good news of the kingdom. And what was he proclaiming? He was proclaiming the good news of the kingdom. It wasn't the good news of the church, but it was the good news of the kingdom. Now, when I'm saying that, I'm not downplaying the church. Don't get me wrong, okay? But what I'm saying is, I'm just highlighting the fact that the kingdom of God was very important for Jesus. The kingdom of God is a very important theme in the New Testament and hence it's important for us to also study and learn and to know it. Okay. So Jesus went about proclaiming the good news of the gospel of the kingdom of God. He healed all the sick and all those who were, um, had disease among the people. Okay. So when the king of the kingdom, who's the king of the kingdom? Jesus, when the king of the king kingdom stepped into this world, he stepped into this world to recover the people whom he intended to be heirs of his kingdom. Okay. And he personally came to usher in, that means to bring in the kingdom of God over the earth. And, uh, you know, where he intended to have this kingdom executed here, he came and he established that kingdom here and who he wanted to be part of the kingdom. He purchased them back. He redeemed them back to be his heirs. So the, and he gave them the keys of the kingdom. He gave them the authority of the kingdom. Okay. Now, um, many earthly kings, you know, who wish to extend their kingdom here on earth, uh, what do they do when they want to you know, gain access over another kingdom. What do they do? Huh? War, yes. So in the war, who do they send? Soldiers, they send their, uh, you know, uh, uh, abled generals, okay? And sometimes the king himself goes, but sometimes the king doesn't go also. He sends his able generals and he sends his army to conquer, right? But the king of our kingdom, and that is Jesus, you know, of course, he sent a forerunner, and that was John the Baptist, to announce the coming of his kingdom. But we see that this king comes personally. Amen. This king comes personally to bring the kingdom of God here on earth. He revealed firsthand, you know, the different aspects of the 
kingdom. He revealed firsthand the nature of the kingdom, what it is to be like in this kingdom, how it is to live in this kingdom, how it is to operate out of this kingdom. So everything that Jesus taught, how he lived his life, all the signs, miracles, and wonders, showing the love, showing the compassion, showing the forgiveness of God, everything that he did, he basically was revealing, of course, the Father heart of God, but he was also revealing firsthand the nature of the kingdom of God. What would the kingdom of heaven look like? How you should operate and how you should be part of the kingdom here on earth. So anything you want to know about the kingdom of God, who do you look at? You look at the person and the work of Jesus Christ because he modeled to us the kingdom of heaven here on earth and he gave us an open invitation. So everyone who's interested to come into that kingdom can be part of that kingdom. Okay. So another aspect of the kingdom that we can learn about is the kingdom of God, uh, two dimensions of the kingdom. What are the two di dimensions of the kingdom? Spiritual and natural, okay? Physical or natural, the spiritual dimension and the natural dimension, okay? Now, in the Bible, there is both aspects of the spiritual and the natural di kingdom. Now, what does the spiritual kingdom have to do with? Any idea? The spiritual kingdom has to do with what? The spirit realm? You can't see, okay? It's not tangible, okay? Good try. Huh? King's domain and rule, okay? The spiritual kingdom has to do with the rule, the reign, the domain of the king who is God in the hearts and lives of the people. That is what is meaning of the spiritual dimension of the kingdom of God. The spiritual dimension of the kingdom of God is basically talking about or has to do with the rule, the reign uh, of God or the king in the hearts and the lives of his people. Okay, So that you and I experience now really the rule and reign of God, the kingdom of God uh, in our hearts and lives. So as of now, as of the present day, which aspect or dimension of the kingdom of God we are experiencing? Are we experiencing both or are we experiencing one? We're experiencing both, okay? It's always both. We're actually experiencing we only... experience is spiritual. Right. Yes. Why do you say, get true, that we are uh, experiencing the spiritual dimension? Because we still don't know how to receive the kingdom of God on earth. Okay. Actually, right we now... We are not uh, strictly following all the uh, rules and what Jesus has given us. There is some, some limit, but not to the full. Okay. Thank you. So as of now, we all are experiencing the rule, the reign, the domain of God in our hearts and in our lives. And we're experiencing the spiritual dimension of the kingdom of God. But I said there is also the natural dimension, yes. And the natural dimension is basically the literal kingdom of God. Literally when God will establish his kingdom, rule, reign, domain here on earth. And when is that going to happen? When is that going to happen? When are we going to literally live and experience? In the, the millennium. Yes, millennium in the millennium rule. kingdom. Yes, thank you. In the millennium. Thank you, Deepu. The millennium, millennium kingdom, right? When um, Jesus himself will return, that will be the battle of the Armageddon. And then he will overthrow all the armies of the earth and he will establish his kingdom here in Jerusalem. Okay? Daniel chapter 7. Okay. It tells us about the kingdom of God that will be given to whom? That natural kingdom, the literal kingdom will be given to whom? To whom? To us, yes. Will be given to St. Uh, John, St. Uh, Nelson, St. Uh, Diksha, <laughs> uh, St. Uh, Gertrude, Mariam, Lucy. You know, all of us will be saints, you know, and uh, we will all be given... Uh, rulership, government authorities. So some of you who are working very hard, you know, 
Some of you are being mission. Some of them are being missionaries, evangelists, going from place to place. Nobody knows their names. They're just laboring hard for the Lord. You know, they might be persecuted. They may be killed. But God is going to reward them. And where is the reward going to be? Millennium Kingdom. Before it happens in heaven eternally, here in the Millennium Kingdom. So some of you will be prime ministers, deputy prime ministers, chief ministers. You know, all based on how well you have run your race here on earth. So don't be disappointed when you are working hard, when you're standing up for God, when you're serving him day and night. Nobody's applauding you. Nobody's rewarding you. Nobody is. There is no name, fame. Your poster is not there anywhere. You know, but you are just serving the Lord faithfully. You will be given positions. You will be called saint so-and-so in the millennium kingdom. Are you all excited? And you will, you will administer the literal kingdom of God. You will administer the natural kingdom of God. God. That is when we will literally see when Jesus himself will rule and reign the thousand year and we will see his literal kingdom coming here on earth. Amen. Okay, please take the mic. Hmm. Put it up. Huh. Yeah. In the Millennium Kingdom, so like Abraham and Moses, those people also will be there. Yeah, everyone will be there. Yes. So you can see uh, Grandpa Abraham, <laughs> Grandpa Moses and all that. Okay, great grandparents. Okay. So, um, there's, yes, can you please use the mic? Our online students would also love to hear you. When we go to that Millennium Kingdom, so here we have relations like mom, dad. Mm -hmm. So that that time we'll be in spirit or we'll get that body like we have now how will how we will uh, recognize them so uh, this is happening after the um, rapture right so when rapture happens what we will all be uh, you know in the flash of twinkling of the eye we will have our spiritual bodies we will no longer be having our uh, natural bodies but uh, spiritual bodies and you know our, in our spiritual bodies is not that nobody can identify us they can identify us so we will be able to identify each other and we'll all be living together yes okay so right now we are experiencing we are walking in which aspect or dimension of the kingdom the spiritual aspect of the kingdom of God, but there will be the literal dimension of the natural uh, kingdom that will happen sometime way into the future. Okay. And, um, uh, and so we are going to be focusing in our study here. We will be fo focusing about the spiritual dimension of this kingdom, not the natural dimension. Natural dimension, you will learn about the, your course in eschatology and, uh, and all of those things. Okay. Now, Having said all of this, how does it affect your life and my life on a daily basis? All that we have said so far, what does it mean to us? What does it mean to us? How does it affect our life and our, uh, uh, on a daily basis? We are not confined to the things of the world. We have something better to look forward to. Amen? Yes? We have to focus on the spiritual aspects of the kingdom and prepare ourselves to be part of the literal kingdom as well. Okay. So how do we enter this kingdom? How do we become part of the kingdom of God? Simple. How do we enter the kingdom of God? How can we, how, when By do we become? being born again. Yes, yeah, simple as that. We are born in, when we are born into the kingdom. Look at what Jesus says in John chapter 3 verses 3. And five. Some somebody please read John chapter three, verse three and verse five. Where's the mic? John chapter three, three and five. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say, say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So what is Jesus saying here? 
you want to be part of the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. And you have to be born from? From above, right? You have to be born from above. That is to receive spiritual transformation. And that spiritual transformation only God can impart into human heart. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit and His Word. Okay, I'll say that again. To be born again, we have to be born from above. It means to receive a spiritual transformation which only God can impart to human heart. And this is through the work of His Word and His Holy Spirit. Okay, so when we are born again, we are ushered into the kingdom of God. We begin to experience the kingdom of God in its spiritual dimension. And that spiritual dimension is where? Is within us. Okay, so the spiritual dimension is within us and through us it's extended to the earth. So we are in his kingdom and his kingdom is in us. Amen. We are in his kingdom and his kingdom is in us and we are to, uh, you know, uh, take his kingdom out in this world. Okay. Um, now, whenever we, um, you know, lead somebody to salvation, uh, what is the next thing that we do? We get them to pray the salvation prayer, yes. Then what is the next thing that we do for them? Help them. Okay? When we lead somebody to Christ, what do you do after you le let them to Jesus Christ? You leave them? Water by baptism. Them? Okay, you get them water baptized. For, for water baptism, what do you have to do? Yeah, all that is over. Repentance of sin is over. What do you do? Fellowship, yes. You get them to be part of the body of Christ. You get them to a, be part of a good local church. You plug them into a local church and that is very, very good. And we must continue doing that. But something that we miss out is that when a person is born again, he's born again into the... Into the... He's born into what? The kingdom of God. Do we really talk about the kingdom of God to them? After we have ushered them into the kingdom, after we have ushered them into being uh, saved? No, right? That mm -hmm. is what we need to do, right? I'm not saying don't plug them to a church. All that is important. But we need to start telling people that when they are born again, they are part of God's kingdom. They're not part of this kingdom or the lifestyle or the, the rule, the reign, uh, the lifestyle of this earth okay look at how paul put it in colossians chapter 1 verse 13 and 14 can somebody read colossians chapter 1 verse 13 and 14 please colossians chapter 1 verse 12 and 13 can, can somebody... i read sister yes please thank you colossians 1 12 and 13 giving thanks to the father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. Amen. So when we got saved, what did God do for us? What does this verse say? He delivered us and then he transferred us, conveyed us into his kingdom. So you are now part of God's kingdom and God's kingdom is now within you. You have been born into that kingdom. Okay. And so now we live as people who are part of the kingdom and we manifest the kingdom's nature, kingdom dimension in every aspect of our lives. Okay. So that is one of the objectives of our study in the kingdom of God, that we want the kingdom of God, you know, that is inside us to be manifested through us every day in our lives. Amen. We look at uh, one of Jesus' parables. We look uh, at many of them later on when we, uh, in the study. But now we look at one of Jesus' parables in Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 to 40. Okay. Now, Jesus spoke many parables about the kingdom of God, but we're looking at one parable now. And it's the parable of the wheat and the Wheat and the tares. Okay, Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 to 40. So in this, Jesus says there was a man who had a field. He went and sowed good seeds or bad seeds? 
good seeds, obviously, right? He went and sowed good uh, wheat in his field. Now, when the wheat began to spring up, the enemy came and he started sowing tears in that field, okay? He started sowing tears in that field, okay? And the tares also sprung up. And, uh, you know, the disciples asked Jesus at the later point, what is the meaning of this story? Or what is the meaning of this parable? So in Matthew chapter 13, verses 36 to 40, Jesus goes on to explain that parable. So can somebody please read that? 36 to 40. Matthew 13, 36 to 40. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, and the good seeds are the son, sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the de devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burnt in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. Amen. So here in this little picture, Jesus is describing uh, the scenario of what would happen, uh, what is happening in the world right now, and also what will happen in the end. Okay, what is happening in the world right now and also what is happening in the end. So just a few things that I can bring to your attention. Uh, who is the son of man mentioned here? And who is sowing the good seeds? Jesus. And who are the good seeds? Son of God? Who, who, who are the good seeds? The believers. Believers, yes. The sons and daughters of the kingdom who have believed in him. Okay. So you and I are sons of and daughters of the kingdom because I believe all of us are born again. So you are good seeds that are sown in this world by Jesus Christ. Okay, so he's put you here on this earth for a reason, okay, which means he's created you here for a purpose. And um, uh, he de and he tells us that there are two kinds of people here on the earth. What are the two kinds of people here on the earth? Good and bad, okay, in this concept, in this co context. Yeah, sons and daughters of the kingdom, good, and sons and daughters of the wicked one. There are no hybrids. You can't be both. <laughs> you know, you can't be both. You can't be good and bad. You either belong to this kingdom or you belong to that kingdom. You can't have one leg here, you can't have one leg there. No hybrids, okay? So either you're the son of the king and daughter of the kingdom of God or you're son and daughter of the, um, of the wicked one. Okay, full stop, period. Nothing more to say about that, okay? So you're either the wheat or you are the tares, okay? So as a believer, as a son and daughter of the kingdom, you have been sown here into this world, okay? And so I want to highlight this, that your purpose in this world is connected to the fact that you are a son and daughter of the kingdom of God, okay? So that's the only reason that you are here. The only reason that you are here is that you are a son and daughter of the kingdom of God. Yes, having good education is important. Having a good job is also important. All that is good. Okay. But you are not defined by your education. You are not defined by your job. You are not defined by your career or whatever you're doing on the earth. Your purpose, your mission is this, that you are a son and daughter of the kingdom of God. Amen. And if that defines who you are and that defines what you are doing here on earth. Yes, your job, your education, your career, all are means through which, you know, you express this fact that you are the son and daughter of the kingdom. So even if you are a teacher, even if you are a businessman, even if you are a, a working professional, whoever you are, you are in that place and you are supposed to extend the kingdom of God, which means you are supposed to, uh, bring about God's rule, his reign, his domain, his authority in that place. If you are the head of the home, you are the wife, you are, um, you know, uh, whoever you are in the home, it is your responsibility bringing the rule, the reign, the domain of God's kingdom in your 
home. Okay. So all of these things are avenues. They are places or avenues of the fact that you are the seed sown here by the Lord on the earth and that uh, he has put you here on display to extend his kingdom. Okay. So that is our identity. So that is what I want you to look at. That, he, hey, I don't no longer look at myself as a slave of Satan, slave of sin, but I am a son and daughter of the kingdom of God. I'm a heir of God, co heir with Jesus Christ. I have been given the keys of authority. I've been given the responsibility. And my identity first is, or my purpose here that God has put me here as good seed is to extend his kingdom here on earth okay so that is chapter one for us and i want you to challenge you with this i want you i want to challenge you um you know that we need to operate from this kingdom perspective now have now have you caught that kingdom perspective yes or no you know what's a kingdom perspective you know what's a kingdom mindset so how would you live your life from that kingdom perspective okay how would you operate if you saw everything from that kingdom perspective, that you are the son and daughter of God? The keys of authority of the kingdom has been given to you. You have been given the authority here on earth to establish his will, to extend his kingdom here on earth. How will you operate out of that? What would you do? Okay. What would you do? Okay. And what would you strive for? Or how would you invest your time and energy and efforts if you saw yourself from this kingdom perspective as a son and daughter of God, as a heir of God? Okay. So we saw that this is God's plan, that he wanted to prepare a kingdom for people who would inherit his kingdom. That is you and me. He wants us to be heirs of that kingdom. And he's unfolding his plans right now in and through us, all of us who are born again. The spiritual dimension of the kingdom is here and now. It is in our hearts and lives. And through our hearts and lives, God is looking at it to be extended here on earth. Okay. So um, how would you live from that kingdom perspective? Okay. How would you change your life? How would you change your minds, mindsets to live from that kingdom of God perspective? Okay. So that is what I want you to think about. Okay, so that was chapter one. Anyone has any questions, any doubts? Before we move on to chapter two. Uh, Ma'am, now we learn about the authority, and uh, we learn we are the we have the authority which Jesus gave to us. Yes. So, but the uh, now we're learning it's very good. But when we used to uh, get those types of situations, and that time we need to remember this, so it became very difficult for us. So, how can we uh, do that? It's not that time. You have to start from now. From now itself, in anything and everything, you need to look at yourself from that, see yourself from that kingdom perspective. Where are you seated now? What is your spiritual identification? Where are you seated? In Christ Jesus in the heavenly realms. And what does that mean? That is our spiritual identification. But what does that mean? That we are seated with God, the right hand of God. What does that mean? What does that mean? Yes, it's not about just that you're having spiritual authority, but you look everything on this earth from a kingdom perspective, from the kingdom of heaven perspective. So when you are trying to do something and you say, hey, I can't do this, I'm, I'm useless, I'm hopeless, I'll never, that's a wrong identity. You can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God has called me for this. You know, he's put me here. He's going to give me the grace, the abilities, the strength to do this. 
So you always have to walk conscious uh, of who you are in Christ and uh, think about everything from a kingdom perspective. So you say, okay, you know, this is happening because uh, of the enemy. You know, well, the enemy on the cross has already been disarmed. He's already paralyzed. He's, he's absolutely nothing. Every power is stripped out of him. So you need to see yourself as saying, hey, I am being terrorized by the enemy. Okay. And uh, as a son and daughter of God, you know, I am no, I'm not a slave under him. No, I'm not, uh, uh, you know, subjected under him. I have dominion and power over him. So I need to exercise my dominion and power over this area of my life. So that is why it's very important when you pray, you pray that God, let your kingdom, let you pray every day like this, God, let your kingdom uh, come, let your will be done in my mind, in my emotions, over my finances. So what are you saying? God, in, in heaven, there is no poverty. I declare that you know, over my finances. You know, in heaven, I declare your kingdom reign, your kingdom rule, your kingdom domain, your kingdom presence over my family. That means what are you saying? In heaven, there is no, uh, there is no um, uh, strife, there is no uh, lack, there is no sickness. I declare that over my family. God, I declare your kingdom rule, reign, presence, uh, authority uh, in my in my job uh, place in my place that I work in my office. What are you saying, God? Your kingdom principles of righteousness, of justice, of uh, right ethical living, of right moral living. That is what you are speaking. So you you need to speak. So when you pray every day, you pray from that. You pray like that. God, I establish or I I speak your kingdom reign, rule, domain over my finances, over my family, over my marriage, over my children, over my job, over my mind, over my uh, weaknesses, over the areas where I'm sinning God. So you're basically inviting his rule, his reign, his presence to come and invade and to remove all that is not of God. And so, so you don't have to wait when you are in a situation you say, hey, I'm not thinking from kingdom perspective. Pray out of that kingdom perspective. You live out of that pers kingdom perspective. And you stop yourself at times when you're saying, hey, this is not what who God has called me to be. Or this is not what God has asked me to be. I'm a heir of God. He's given me the authority. I have to exercise my authority. Right? So uh, sometimes we can say that we are oppressed, we are depressed. And we're giving in to the work of the enemy. God has not called us to be oppressed and depressed. He has called us to subdue the enemy. He has given us the dom dominion. He has given us everything that we need for uh, life and for godly living. He's given us all the things that we need for our warfare. We need to use it. Right? So uh, how do I live a life that reflects the kingdom of God in my life? Okay, Miriam is asked, throwing the question back to me. <laughs> okay, how do I live life that reflects the kingdom of God in my life? I just now said that. Okay, you have to think. You have to see everything from a kingdom perspective. And you have to live everything the kingdom perspective. For example, when you are seeing oppression, when you are seeing hindrances, when you are seeing that it is your spiritual right for healing. Right? Remember Jesus goes to synagogue and he sees a woman bent over. No, she's bent over. Does she come to Jesus for healing? Does she ask Jesus for healing? Yes, no? No. But does Jesus heal her? Yes. Why? He says that as a, as a daughter of Abraham, it's her birthright to be healed. And who's robbing her of that birthright? Satan. So, you know, you don't, you, we, we all face sicknesses and disease and, you know, go through uh, challenges. But then we rise up and say, God, as, as, as a child in your kingdom, it's my birthright to, you know, to be healed, to receive healing, to receive wholeness. And uh, if you are in debt or you are uh, financial problems or difficulties, whatever, you say, God, this, as, as a son, as your daughter, you know, as a part of your kingdom, this is my right. This is my, this one. So I'm claiming and I'm speaking. You know, or in your home, you see there is no peace, there's no joy, there's strife, there's conflict, uh, there's hatred, there's enmity. Speak God's kingdom over there in your workplace um, as well. So 
that is what you need to do and also look at things from a kingdom uh, perspective that means you know some of us think hey i can't overcome this sin right what what but what does paul say in romans chapter 6 we are dead to sin he says we are already dead to sin sin has no control over us sin has no dominion over us sin has no power over us so you don't say that you know i can't overcome that weakness i can't stop getting angry i, I can't stop uh, you know uh, screaming and shouting and throwing tantrums or temper uh, this one you know when i get angry no you you can't give those excuses why because sin has no control over you you are dead to sin because you're part of the kingdom of god so it's important for you to know what are the different aspects of the kingdom of god and how do you know that when you read the bible okay and you need to know how you walk in that. So Jesus exactly, you know, modeled that for us. Jesus was never sick. Yes, he was tired, but he had the strength of God. Okay. He was busy, but he spent time with God. He was able to forgive and he was able to do mighty signs, miracles and wonders to the power of the Holy Spirit. And we can also do the same. Does that help, Miriam? Yes. Okay. Make the conscious effort to, you know, to stop uh, what you're thinking, your, uh, and to think from kingdom perspective. Yes. Uh, like you just said, uh, in my father's house there are many rooms. But again, he says, if there is not, I'll prepare. So why this line is there? What is? You just said, in my father's house. There are many rooms. Hmm. And next, he says, if not so, I will prepare for you. Hmm. If there are not sufficient. So why this sufficient? What is? Why? What is? Like in, uh, what is the last sentence you said, please? I can't hear. My, you should speak loudly. In my father's house are many rooms. Hmm. If it were not so, hmm. I would have told you that I, I go to prepare a place for you. Okay. So, why Jesus told that I'll go and prepare for you already? There would be enough space for us. Okay. But still, why did Jesus mention this? Why does he say I'll go and prepare a place for you? Yeah, That's just giving us an assurance that there is a place for us. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> we'll just look at it simply like that. Which uh, uh, Matthew? Where is that? Sister, I have one uh, question. Yes. Uh, can you hear me, sister? Yes. Oh, yes, uh, yes, I now, can hear you. Uh, the thing is, we change our mindset by believing all that the promises Jesus has said in the His Word, and then we start praying accordingly, right? Sorry, can you say that again? For the kingdom uh, inheritance, that to enjoy all His spiritual blessings, we just uh, believe all the Word and all the promises Jesus has said and pray accordingly. Yes, you have to, you know it, you believe it, you confess it, you speak it over your life, and you walk in that truth, yes. You exercise, okay, you yeah. exercise in that, yes. Thank you, sister. Thank you. So here, um, coming back to yours, uh, John chapter 14, verse 2, where Jesus says, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go and prepare for a place for you. So Jesus is assuring his disciples. He, they're very sad, right? He's going away. He's assuring his disciples that, yeah, there is a place for them, many rooms and all of that. There's abundance of space in the kingdom of God. That means there is room for a lot of believers. It's time. This one. Bell is gone, huh? There's one more minute. So when Jesus says, I go and prepare a place for you, he's uh, emphasizing his 
uh, you know, his active role, okay, ensuring that all the people who believe in him, you know, believe what he has done on the cross, the sacrifice that he's made on the cross, that his sacrifice on the cross is made a way for believers to enter into eternal life. And uh, that is giving an assurance, okay, that yes, when you accept me, there's an assurance that he is going to go and prepare a place for you. So there is an assurance. Okay. So that he's just talking about his active uh, role in the whole thing. Yes. Okay. Thank you everyone for uh, joining class. Um, we'll continue next week with chapter two. Uh, please remember there is no class tomorrow. We celebrate our Independence Day. So it's a holiday. So happy Independence Day to all of you and enjoy your holiday. Thank you so much. Bye.